Well, welcome back, and this is going to be the last video on JFET amplifier c configurations. And in this video, we'll cover the the common gate, and the common gate would be analogous to the common base in the BJTs. And if you remember anything about BJT common bases, you'll recall that they have a pretty good voltage gain, but they don't have a current gain. And we're going to see that the common gate amplifier has the same general characteristics. So here is the drawing of the circuit that we're going to do the analysis of. And then we're going to actually build and test our theory. And you'll see that the input from our signal source goes right to the source of our JFET. So that signal source is going to go into the JFET, which we're going to turn on, and the signal then will come out of the drain. We're going to be using self-bias, and notice we don't have any kind of resistor on on the gate. We, we don't need it because the voltage that's developed up on RS with the current going through it during, during its self-bias is going to generate some voltage. So let's say that we had uh, 4 volts. And of course that's positive to negative. And this negative is attached to the gate. So as far as the gate is concerned, it's feeling a negative 4 volt potential. And so no resistor required. And since it's reverse biased, there's also no current. We have a, a drain resistor and we're going to have a voltage drop on it, of course, and then um, taking this voltage drop and the voltage drop on RS, we can find out what the voltage would be from the, from the drain to the source. And the AC, or the DC, is going to have no effect on RL because we have this blocking capacitor, and we won't get any DC also leaking into our, our signal source. Uh, to protect it. So let's go ahead and find the, the voltages that uh, we would expect to see on, on RS and on RD. Now the calculation to find the drain current is based on knowing a couple of parameters that the device has and we're going to be using an MPF 102. So IDSS can be anywhere from from 2 milliamps all the way up to to 20 milliamps, uh, which is it's just too big a variation that we're going to have for this. So I'm going to use what I know is uh, the char what, what I know are the characteristics for the JFET that I'm using the experiment. And I happen to know that its IDSS is 11 and a half milliamps. And I also know that its VGS off, is 3.4 volts and let's shoot for a voltage gate to source of 2 volts and plugging all of these values in we should get a current of 1.95 milliamps so we know the current that's going to be going through RS and RD is going to be 1.95 milliamps or each component. Well now that we know what current we're going to have going through the drain, uh, 1.95 milliamps, and we know the re drain resistor's value is 1K, so we're looking for a VRS of 1.95 volts. So having 1.95 volts on this resistor means that we have negative 1.95 volts from gate to source. And again for the drain resistor, 2K in this case, we still have the same current, 1.95 milliamps times 2K. So we're looking at 3.9 volts at this point. Well the only thing left to drop any voltage from VDD is going to be the JFET itself and that's going to give us our drain to source voltage. So knowing 
and that we have 20 volts applied and subtracting the sum of the voltage drops 1.95 and 3.9 we should have a drain to source voltage of 14.15 volts. And if we want to find out the load line of the device, we just have to use this. It's really the same calculations that you used in, in transistors, except we had VCC and RC and RE. So we're still looking at the 20 volts, for, and we're going to divide that by the sum of RS and RD, which happen to be 2K and 1K. So we have a 3K ohms total, and we get a current of 6.3. 6.7 milliamps, so the DC current can't go any higher than this, and of course the DC voltage can't go any higher than VDD, so we're looking at 20 volts for the, for the cutoff value. So let's go ahead and take a look at this now from uh, the AC signal standpoint. Shown here is the circuit as the AC signal would see it, so here's our our signal source and its output is going to go through its whatever the internal resistance of the source is and if we have a function generator almost all of them have a 50 ohm uh, output impedance and then of course the signal is going to go through RS and we're going to be also going through R S the source resistor and which is going to give us a little bit of a voltage divider effect but the main current is going straight through the device uh, that current of course is set by the value of the voltage gate to source uh, and the arrow here indicates that we have a, a constant current device so our current again is traveling through the device and it is going to split when it gets to the drain so we're going to have RD in parallel with RL so in a nutshell we have an output side here uh, RD in parallel with RL and the input of our, our, of our device is actually the JFET itself and its resistance is GM and if you recall the common base the voltage gain of the device was RC in parallel with RL divided by REJ or R prime E, whichever way you wanted to, to say it. And if you look at this, remember that GM is just the reciprocal of resistance. So instead of doing a division problem with resistance, we do a multiplication problem with this of RC in parallel with RL and that's how we're going to get our our voltage gain from the from the device. But before we can do anything else we need to know what the value of, of GM is going to be. And GM going from the MPF data sheet can vary anywhere from 2000 microsiemens all the way up to 7500 microsiemens. Now from experience I know that when I've over the regions that I've operated, the, the, the MPF 102s, they tended to be right around 3,000 microsiemens, and about, that's a variation of about 10-15%. So I'm pretty comfortable with just sticking this value into the equations, uh, and that's what we're going to, to do here. But uh, let's do the calculations making the assumption that we have uh, this big variation in values. So our GM can be anywhere from that 2,000 micro siemens, so 1 over 2,000 micro in parallel with 1K all the way up to 7,500 micro in parallel with the same 1k and probably the most realistic value was would be 1 over the 3000 micro in parallel with 1k so you can see that we can get a pretty wide range of resistances um, this one would be about 333 ohms 
the 7,500 micro would give us approximately 115 or 117 ohms. I, and then, though, using the more or less practical value, that's going to give us a value of 250 ohms. And we're going to use this for our, our Zn value. So we have 250 ohms for our impedance going in. Our output impedance is going to be, as we mentioned briefly, these two resistors in parallel here and here and using RD and RL we end up with 1.93 K ohms for our output impedance. Now what you'll notice something I hope you notice something that we are essentially taking a current remember this is a constant current device and we're taking the current through here and we're buffering it between a low impedance at the input 250 ohms in this case and a high impedance at the output so the common gate is a current buffer and that's its it, that's its chief uh, application it also gives you some some decent voltage gain again no current gain it's all one big path through here but it does give you excellent voltage gain so at this stage we know uh, that we have 1.93 K ohms at as Z out so we'll mark that down here now we can find what the gain of the circuit is so we know that the GM now, now this is not the same as ZN because we are not looking at we're looking at this as being our input resistance source and this as being the output resistance remember RD in parallel with RL divided by GM or multiplied by GM remember in transistors this would have been RC we still have RL but this would have been R prime E so we had essentially a voltage divider between these two points we had X amount of voltage dropped here on these two large resistors we had X amount of voltage dropped on on RE now using the extreme values we can even if we don't know that you know typically we might operate at 3000 microsiemens we can find the extreme values for the voltage gain by using the extreme values for the conductance so we have a veil a range of anywhere from 2000 microsiemens for the first one so we take the 2000 micro and we would multiply it by 1.93 K ohms and we would get a gain of 3.86 if we now plug the 7500 micro siemens into the equation 1.93 K again we would get a gain of 14 point four eight well the most reasonable assumption would be okay let's go with this 3000 micro and then we, again we have the 1.93 K ohms and we would get a gain of 5.79 so this is the gain that we're going to go with so we're going to assume for our our purposes that the gain is 5.79 so the voltage out then, given a gain of 5.79, we're, when I uh, build this uh, circuit, um, I intend to put in, to measure, one volt peak to peak at this actual input. And that's just to make our, our calculations a little bit easier because I don't want to have to, initially at least, include the internal resistance of our, our source. So in putting, inputting one volt peak to peak, remember that the voltage out is equal to the voltage gain times the VN and with a 5.79 volt or 5.79 gain times 
one volt coming in, of course, easy enough, we get 5.79 volts coming out. If I wanted to include the value of RS in the calculations, I would have to rearrange the equation like this. And but now I'm including my, my Zn, so that's my 250 ohms that I have here. But I also remember I have to include that value of RS because the resistance of the source resistor is in series with the resistance of our signal source. It's rather confusing with all the RSs. And this is going to act like a voltage divider. It's just like uh, doing a voltage divider bias for the base of a of a transistor or a JFET. We have we're interested in the effect that RS is going to have in splitting the voltage. So using these values, and again using the 3000 microsiemens, so we have 3000 micro and multiplied by the parallel value of RD and RS, so that's 1.93K times 250 over RS, and we're going to assume we have a 50 ohm resistor, which we do. And we're using a standard function generator, or will be, plus our 250 ohm impedance. We now would get a gain of about 4.83. So we have 5.79 without including the value of the source resistance and we have 4.83 by including the value. So where did that roughly 9.9 gain actually go? And to be honest with you it didn't go anywhere. If I am measuring 1 volt peak to peak at this point I'm measuring 1 volt peak to peak across the resistance on the source. I have adjusted this function generator then to give me this value of 1 volt peak to peak. Well if that's the case and I have a voltage divider here, if I have 1 volt peak to peak here, I must have a voltage drop here as well, so our signal input must be a little bit larger. And it's going to be about 25 percent larger. So roughly we're looking at at this point an input of about 1.25 volts peak to peak. If you take that 1.25 now and multiply it by 4.83, so we have 4. Point, oh, wrong place. We have 4.83 times 1.25. I'll try to squeeze that in so it's somewhat legible. You're again going to get roughly the 5.8 volts coming out. So this calculation, all it did it, is it, it took into account uh, the value of that resistance, RS, uh, the source resistance, but we now use the actual input voltage from the function generator as measured at this point. So we included the voltage drop here, where in, the, in this calculation here, uh, we did not include RS, so we just measured the voltage that was actually at that output. And the last thing that we can look at before we build the lab and maybe look at a, a little graph of what we have is coming up with the saturation and cutoff for the AC voltage or the AC side of of the circuit. And for that again we're going to use ID which is our DC value because the the AC has to be anchored to that point. Remember, it's a Q point that, that's set by DC, and AC is anchored to it. So we have our, our current of 1.95 milliamps plus our drain to source voltage of 14.15 volts, and we divide it by the value of RD, 1.93. K and we end up with a current of 9.28 milliamps. 
And for the cutoff voltage, we again have 14.15 plus the 1.95 milliamps DC drain current times the 1.93 K ohms. And we get 17 point nine one volts. So there's our AC load line as well. And we'll go ahead and plot these points and then go ahead and work on the circuit. Here's the the drain curve for the device that we're going to be using in the experiment. So I've already already characterized it. Now let's go ahead and find the the Q point on the drain to source side using the the values that we had gotten earlier and as a reminder for the DC we had 6.67 milliamps for the saturation cur current and the maximum voltage we could have was of course 20 volts and if we add that to our graph we're going from 20 to 6.67, which would be approximately at this point. And I'm just going to go ahead and extend it through there. And there's our, our DC load line. For the AC, the values were 9.28 milliamps for the AC, maximum AC current with a voltage of 17.91. And adding that, so 17.91 would be roughly at this point and 9.28 uh, approximately here and going through and the intersection of the two lines would give us our, our Q point not to mention that we already had the Q point calculated from our VDS and we determined that that was 14.15 volts from drain to source and that looks like it's pretty close to that value. If you wanted to find the Q point and you didn't have this bit of information you could use the circuit uh, to to see where it would intersect the line um, at this point. Remember we need two points and the first would be what would be the voltage gate to source when we have zero milliamps for the drain current. And of course this zero milliamps has to be going through our our source resistor because it's the source resistor that gives us the VGS. And zero milliamps, to, no, no matter how much resistance we have, is still going to be zero volts. So our origin point is always going to be zero, zero. So our, there's our first point. Zero volts and zero amps. The, the second point would be what's the voltage gate to source going to be when we're at the saturation current and the saturation current for the device is roughly 11 and a half milliamps so we know that's one of the points and it's going through a 1k ohm resistor so 11 and a half milliamps times 1k would give us 11.5 volts and that's our second point and if we connect the dots from our origin point to 11 and a half at 11 and a half so here's our 11 and a half milliamps and here's our 11 and a half volts and you'll see the Q point is right around 2 milliamps with a voltage gate to source of of minus 2. So again, it's a it's a good circuit. If we wanted to get the transconductance from this circuit uh, from this graph, it, it would be difficult because the variations in the voltages are, are just so small that the, the the distance that we moved up and down this line, our drain line, would be uh, almost impossible to read and I've, I've, I've messed around with it and uh, on this scale and it, it's, I, 
I can come out to, you know, within about 20% of, of the right answer just because of the scale of the drawing, but, but it does indeed work. So here's our, our again, uh, our, our AC load line, our DC load line, our, our Q point, which confirms that 14.15 was correct. And then this is the, the self-bias load line using uh, the two coordinates that you're always going to come up with, one of them for voltage at saturation, which is uh, just saturation current times whatever resistance there is, and the other one at when there's no current, so, and that's always going to be zero and zero. And both of these should be on the same line. So now let's go ahead and run the experiment, see what kind of voltage gain we get, and confirm our, our math and our theory. This is the common gate circuit that we just looked at, built on the breadboard. And of course, here is the the gate of my JFET, and it's attached directly to ground. The source has the input coming in. And the source is also connected to the 1K ohm resistor to ground. And the drain has the, the 2K ohm resistor and also connected to the drain is the output which is our 56k ohm resistor and our decoupling cap to block the DC from getting into the load and our cap to block DC from getting into our our function generator and I've got a couple of test points already hooked up so let's go ahead and take a look at the circuit in operation here you can see the DC current or ID that we've got going through the component. We calculated the value of 1.95 milliamps and we have 2.09 so we're very close there. We should have approximately 1.95 volts on the source resistor and we're looking at 2.06 so that was good. Our drain resistor should have 3.9 and we have 4.1 so that's within spec and finally drain to source we should have had 14.15 and we're looking at 13.8 so all of the DC parameters check out well now let's look at the AC values all right, our circuit is hooked up, so our input is going to be on the yellow trace or channel 1. Our output is going to be on the blue trace, it's just channel 2. And this is what the output looks like. And again, you can see the yellow trace, and we're measuring 1 volt peak to peak. And our output in blue is 5.8, and the calculated value was 5.79. Well, this is incredibly close, and uh, I consider myself pretty lucky to have gotten that. And notice again, notice also that everything is in phase, as it should be in a, in a common gate circuit. So we definitely have a, the, the right voltage gain. But let's take a look at what the function generator is actually set on. You'll notice that I had to set my function generator about uh, well a, a 210 millivolts high to get that one volt peak to peak input you know, on our on our JFET and remember I said that there's going to be a small voltage drop that is present on the value of the the output of our of our function generator and that's 50 ohms so this 50 ohms is in series with the impedance of our JFET and acts as a voltage divider, so it has a slight voltage drop internally. Uh, even if I, if I had set the function generator to 50 ohms, and I have it right now set on high impedance or high Z, this voltage would be cut in half, because now it's going to act like a voltage divider that's, that thinks, this, the, the, the function generator thinks that it's now hooked up to a, a 50 ohm load. So 50 ohms here, 50 ohms on the load, cuts the voltage in half, and it automatically cuts this voltage in half as well. Uh, but that, again, that's a video uh, all on itself. Uh, the main thing that 
you need to remember is that there's going to be a voltage drop on this internal resistance before it ever gets to your to the device that you're testing so measure your voltages on the device you're testing at the input and don't measure your voltages at at the output of your of your function generator your values are going to be going to be off well to sum everything up you can see that uh, had a voltage gain we can't expect a current gain uh, everything was in phase and if you again look at the common base configuration for transistors you'll see that these are are very similar characteristics and the main advantage of a common gate amplifier is that it is an excellent current buffer between a low impedance device at its input to a high impedance device at its output in the next video I'm going to talk about MOSFETs, uh, the D-type and the E-type. Uh, emphasis will be on the E-type since it's the most prevalent uh, nowadays. But we'll talk about the theory and maybe do a, a, a short experiment to, to see how, how they operate. So until next time, uh, thank you for watching and questions. Uh, either post them uh, on, the, on the site or send me an email at theoffsetvolt at gmail.com.